conquers all anxiety Let it rise Let praise arise We sing your name in the dark And it changes everything We sing with all we are And we claim your victory Let it rise Let praise arise We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high We'll all creation cry storms inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our Hey, God bless you guys. We're going to continue with our worship through the bringing of our tithes and our offerings. Before we do that, though, can I just remind you that we have a team of amazing people. We call them chaplains. They've gone through a bunch of training. They've gone through a bunch of prayer and preparation to be ready for you at any moment to help walk you through some difficulties, some challenges, some needs in your life. And they're there to pray for you. And uh, we have a number right there on the screen you can look at. You can call that or you can text it. I know that sometimes maybe you don't want to call and that's okay. We understand that. But would you at least text us what your need is and how we can pray for you? We have a team of wonderful people that want to do that. They move those on to us as a staff and we pray as well. And we're here to resource you in any way we can. So make sure you do that. We're here for you. And uh, in our offering, before we actually receive offering, I just want to take a second and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for helping us as a church remain strong during 2020. 
It's been a crazy, challenging years in uh, so many different ways for so many of us, but because of your faithfulness and because of your continued obedience to God through giving, we were able to continue to do ministry faithfully and in a strong way. And I'm so grateful that you enabled us to do that through your obedience and faithfulness to God. And so we're going to do our offering now. Let me remind you, as the screen comes up a little bit later, tells you all the different ways that you can give. You can send in your offering to the office, but just be reminded that if you want it to be included in your 2020 giving, it has to be postmarked by the 31st. And of course, there's digital ways to get that done immediately, but we're gonna give together. We're gonna do it as an act of worship together and an act of obedience and an act of gratitude to God for all he's been to us and all he'll continue to be to us. Father, we thank you for this time together because you, God, have shown us your favor. You haven't stopped being good. When circumstances change, you don't change. When circumstances get worse, God, your goodness really comes through. You say you are close to the brokenhearted. And if we've had a year that's broken our heart, God, that just means you've drawn even closer to us. And we celebrate, God, our relationship, our care that you give us, the faithfulness that you've shown us. This isn't to buy your favor, God. This is an act of worship to recognize your favor in our lives. We do it now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys as you give. And now check out these announcements for upcoming activities and events here at Summit Church. Hey, God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Do we say that after Christmas? Well, um, this is kind of where we're at, this weird space between Christmas and New Year, this part where we go into what I call the ho-ho-ho hangover. And if you've never heard that expression before, it's probably because I just sort of made it up to maybe put a name on what maybe most of us start feeling about this time. Maybe you've felt it and never really had a name for it. So I'll kind of explain it and then you tell me if you sort of know what I'm talking about. So we actually start emotionally preparing for Christmas in the summer. Maybe you don't think you do, but there are people who are ramping up to Christmas in the summer. Hallmark, after all, plays Christmas movies in July. Sam's and Costco, where we shop a lot, they start selling Christmas stuff in like September, sometimes August, I've seen stuff in there. Christmas decorations, Christmas tree, wrapping paper, things like that. Satellite radio, Lisa and I have XM satellite in our car, and we actually start getting Christmas channels in October. We start listening to Christmas music. And then those of us who love Jesus, I mean, truly love Jesus, we start decorating November 1st, right? And then for a couple months, uh, November, December, as Thanksgiving starts rolling around, it really does seem like people try to be intentionally kinder, more benevolent, more generous, less hostile to each other, less adversarial to each other. It almost feels like we're all committed to be in this together. And then we go through all the Christmas shopping and that gets exciting and fun. And we start exchanging our Christmas list and we even go to virtual parties or real parties and, and we celebrate Christmas with our friends and our family and our coworkers. And then we have Christmas events and church services that really begin to celebrate. And then on Christmas Eve and on Christmas day, we have our special traditions with our families and then the 26th comes and we kind of fall into the ho, ho, ho hangover. When I'm done here today, I'll actually go home and our family will start taking down Christmas decorations. We're not trying to rush it out. It's just, we've got some work being done at the house and we've got to kind of get it out of the way and we got to make room. And that sort of feels like we start doing that in all of the areas of our life. We start boxing Christmas back, back up. We start losing the momentum that we've been building for these last several months 
all of this good stuff. And the true momentum is really the celebration. I mean, the momentum that we're really, really building is that we are more aware of who Jesus is. And we're more aware of the story of Christmas. I mean, even when they're playing Charlie Brown's Christmas on TV, the gospel message is going out. And every time there's a Christmas special on TV with some country artist singing, they're usually doing a song or two about Jesus. The whole world becomes more aware, more present with the truth of who Jesus is and what he did for us. But those of us who are followers of Christ, we've got to get out of the habit of losing this momentum, of slipping into this sort of post-Christmas depression, this blah, this, all right, it's time to get back to our regular lives because there's so much more we can do with this momentum. So we're going to spend just a couple minutes today talking about that, how not to lose the momentum of Christmas, how not to lose the momentum of the story of Christ. Okay, so grab your notes, open your apps if you don't already have them open, and we're going to get started together. To make sure I don't waste the momentum of Christmas, I need to first, number one, do the things I already know I'm supposed to do. Do the things I already know I'm supposed to do. So out of an, uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, this year we decided to not, this was to sort of protect Lisa's parents who are in that vulnerable age uh, to, to get sick, and especially in this culture and, and atmosphere right now. Uh, we decided we were not going together. There's like 25 of us with all the husbands and wives and kids and grandkids. Uh, we decided to not gather as a family this year. So we decided to do um, gather on Zoom. And we wanted to preserve, though, and keep up some of the Christmas traditions that we do as a family. So we gathered on Christmas Eve on Zoom and we do a gift exchange. We kind of dropped all those off. And then we have a time in which one of the kids, um, my in-laws' grandkids, would read the Christmas story. And uh, everybody kind of volunteers each year to do it. And sometimes we do the youngest and sometimes we just let somebody pick. But this year, my niece, Haley, said, I, I, I want to read it. And she opened up her Bible app on her phone and she began to read the story. And she said, well, where do you want me to start? And we said, well, just start at Luke 2, verse 1. And she got reading and she was reading the Christmas story. And then about verse 20, she said, she stopped and she said, well, how, how long do you want me to read? How much further do you want me to go? Do you want me to talk about the circumcision part? And people started laughing like she was joking. And Haley <laughs> said, uh, that's what comes next in the story. Know your Bible, people. And I started laughing because I thought, she's totally right. We sort of stop right where the angel departs in verse 20, and that's sort of where we all stop with the Christmas story. We, we don't move further. There's a lot more in that story, and we just sort of stop because we, we don't see the next part as being important or magical, but I want to tell you the next part, in my opinion, is just as important is everything we read prior to that. And so we're going to kind of hang out in that space because it's important to know what to do. What happens after verse 20 is the perfect roadmap to how you and I should live our lives following December 25th. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's pick up at what my niece calls the circumcision part. Luke 2, 21 through 24. Eight days later, when the baby, Jesus, was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering. As a pregnant woman, a woman who had just given birth, there was a, a purification offering. As required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents, Jesus' parents, took him to Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph, to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's child, first child, is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord. This is so important. You're hearing that phrase over and over again. Either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Maybe you didn't realize two turtle doves 
and a partridge in a pear tree. The two turtle doves have a biblical significance. So here's what happened. I just read this important verse, and I'm going to kind of point out to you why it's so important. So Mary and Joseph had just experienced the most disruptive, disorienting, confusing, overwhelming season of their life. They had both been told that Mary would become pregnant with a child, even though she hadn't been with anyone physically, that she would conceive, uh, that the child would be conceived by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in her life. They're told that the child that they would be giving birth to would be the savior of the world, that they would have to parent the very son of God in flesh. And then the day comes, Jesus is born. Sheep herders, shepherds appear to them and tell them, hey, we were just visited by angels. The angels told us where to, we could find you. We sought you out. We ran to you. We worshiped you. And then listen, uh, then the next day comes and they start the what do we do adventure, the what next adventure, the what are we supposed to do now moment. And I'm going to tell you something. They simply could not have done it better. After all of this overwhelming events and circumstances and changes and, and, and visitations, everything that happens, then Jesus is born and they go, wow, what do we do? I remember when Caleb, our firstborn, was born at St. John's Hospital in Springfield, Missouri, and they started discharging us from the hospital. And I thought, are you out of your minds? You're sending us home with a live baby. We don't know what we're doing. I wish there had been someone there to come home with us, a nurse, a professional, somebody to give us a roadmap on what we we're supposed to do next. But can I tell you what Joseph and Mary did next was amazing. Let me tell you, I'm going to summarize. They named their son just as God had told them to do through the angelic messenger. They did the purification uh, offering just as required by God's law. They dedicated Jesus to the Lord, just as God's word commanded them to do. And they made the bird offering. They gave the turtle dove offering just as they were told to do by scripture. You know what it, that all that tells me is this, when all else fails, when, when you don't know what else to do, when you're struggling to figure out what's next, what am I supposed to do in this next season? Can I tell you this? You do what God has been telling you to do all along. We have this amazing tool in front of us called God's Holy Word. And there is ancient wisdom. There's ancient commandments. There have been God's instruction for our lives for thousands of years. And when you don't know what else to do, when you're thinking, what is the roadmap to success in my life to make sure I'm in the center of God's will? Do what God has been telling you to do. You don't have to wait for angelic visitation. You don't have to wait for writing on the wall. You don't have to wait for anything miraculous to happen. You just go back to the basics. You just obey God's words, his instructions, like others have done thousands of times before and seen God's blessings as a result of that. You see, you and I obediently practicing the mandates of God's word doing everything that we're supposed to be doing has to be the habit of our lives no matter what our circumstances are. Because I want to tell you this, if you're in the center of God's will, you're going to experience some unexpected, even unwelcome, uncomfortable things in your life. And if you start with the beginning of the roadmap, is doing what you already know you're supposed to be doing, what the Bible's been telling us to do all along, how many of our difficulties could be avoided, how many challenges could be overcome, how much more peace would be welcome into our, into our lives if we're just following God's game plan. Number two is this, to make sure I don't waste the momentum of Christmas, I need to, secondly, be near those who will help me hear God's voice. Be near those who will help me hear God's voice. So we're going to get back into the Christmas story, and I call this the director's cut, okay? Because this is the part, these are uh, scenes of the Christmas story we never include in the Christmas story any time uh, of the year. So we're going to pick up with verse 25 now. At that time, there was a man, hang with me, this is a little bit longer of a verse. Hang, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, not someone we normally hear of in the Christmas story. He was a righteous and devout uh, he was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. Ancient scripture, Old Testament, what we call Old Testament, 
had been prophesying and talking about the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, for a long, long time. And he was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he had revealed and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So that says, he had heard from God, the Holy Spirit told him, you won't die until you see the Savior of the world, until you see the Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him, the Holy Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby to the Lord as required by the law, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I get to die now because I have actually seen. I'm holding the Savior of the world. I've seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall. In other words, some will reject him and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. He said to her, there's a lot that's going to happen with this child. He is going to divide nations. Some will rise up and accept him. Some will know salvation because of him and some will reject him, but he will cause trouble and it's going to be heartbreaking to watch the way people treat him. Little did she know that just 33 years later, Jesus would lay down his life for the world. So there are some huge, huge things I want to point out before we move on. First of all, God makes sure to spell out the resume of Simeon before he, in other words, God wants us to see who he is before he tells us what he's going to do. So he tells us that he's a righteous man. He's right standing with God. He's a devout man. He's devoutly committed to being in the center of God's will. He has the favor of God and the spirit, the Holy Spirit was upon him and listen, And he was where he was supposed to be. He was in the temple. And the temple is a place, and we call that church now. The temple is a place where people go to be in the presence of God, to be in the wisdom of God, to be in the instruction of God, to be in the law of God, to be in the love of God, to be in the grace of God, to be in the favor of God. People go there because that is where others are also seeking the presence of God. Simeon was obedient to be in the house of God, and because he was obedient to be in the house of God, and because Mary and Joseph were obedient to be in the house of God, their paths intersected. They collided with each other, and God used Simeon to confirm, to bless, to extend God's voice of favor over Mary and Joseph and over Jesus. Isn't that amazing that when we put ourselves in the right place, and we do the right things, and we listen to the voice of God, and we follow the instruction of God, and we go into the temple of God, and we go into the church, that we're going to run into people who have a word for us. We're going to run in, and and they're going to be Sundays and times when you're hearing a word spoken from the platform, or somebody comes and intersects with you after service, before service, and they've got some wisdom that God has put on their heart to share. And that happens when we go to the right places at the right time. And he wasn't, Simeon wasn't the only voice. God wanted them to know that he had prepared them for this moment. Luke 2, 36 through 38, we're going to continue. Anna, a prophet for all of those really uneducated, uh, biblically illiterate people that think that the Bible and that Christianity demeans women. There is scripture after scripture after scripture in which God establishes women in places of importance, in places of influence. And here's a great example of that. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night. The level of devotion of this woman, worshiping God with fasting and prayer, she came along. She literally lived at the temple, never leaving the presence of God, never leaving the presence of other worshipers. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. In other words, she began to spread the word that the Messiah, 
that the Savior had arrived. Listen, don't ever forget that you and I choose the voices of influence in our life. If you're frustrated, if you're angry, if you're depressed, if you're worked up, you should seriously consider who you're allowing to speak into your life. Now, I'm preaching off my iPad here, but I'll tell you, it does more than that. It can go onto Facebook, it can open up news apps, it can go onto TikTok, it can do anything that your smartphone can do, that your laptop, your desktop, your iPad, your tablet can do. And I'm going to tell you that so many of us let voices into our lives through that device right there, through that phone, through your TV that you sit in front of, or we'll sit down with friends or we'll get on the phone with someone and we let them speak into our minds and our hearts. And I'm going to tell you, they are setting the tone and the direction of your future moments, of your days, of your weeks, your months, and your years to come. Our lives are being set into motion by those we allow us to stir us into movement, into our forward movement. And you and I have to be so, so cautious to make sure we are allowing God's voice into our life through God's people. Third and finally is this, to make sure I don't waste the momentum of Christmas, I need to, number three, make my home a place where God's plan grows. Make my home a place where God's plan grows. So let's finish up the story with verse 39 and 40. I think these are some of actually the most important verses of the Christmas story, director's cut. When Jesus's parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, I love that, when they had made sure to go through all of the basics, check all the boxes, know that they had done the right thing. We're always so, we're searching for God's will in our life and we never start with God's basic will for our lives, which is spelled out in scripture. We want the mystical will of, God will, of God's will. We never want the basics. When, God's, when Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth, In Galilee, remember this was about 90 miles away. There, the child, Jesus, grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. So you may not know this, but there's about 30 years we don't hear about Jesus. They're they're kind of the silent years of Jesus' life. We hear about Jesus' birth. We get this really uh, a brief peek at his life when he's about 12 years old and he's sitting in the temple and he's astounding religious teachers by his knowledge, understanding, his memorization, and the questions that he poses about God's holy word, about ancient scripture, about Old Testament, what we call Old Testament scripture, right? But Mary and Joseph take him home and then we don't hear about Jesus for about 30 years until he emerges in his what we call public ministry, in which Jesus just emerges and begins teaching. He he turns water into wine and the miracles begin to happen. And then for three years, we see Jesus's public ministry before his crucifixion and resurrection, right? So I wonder what happens then in those 30 years, because that is the majority of Jesus's life. We only get to see a very, very, very tiny portion beginning and end, and just a tiny peak right in the middle. So what happens all those other years? I don't personally think there's going to be any intelligent, thoughtful, bright scholars that would argue with me on this. But I'm going to tell you, Mary and Joseph were creating and preserving a place inside their home in which they could fulfill God's plan for their son by helping fulfill and create a space in their home in which they could fulfill God's plan for their life. You see, God had ordained them, anointed them, picked them by hand, prepared them, equipped them to be the earthly parents of his son. And in order for Jesus to fulfill his purpose, Mary and Joseph had to fulfill their purpose. I know that every one of us wants our kids to succeed in life. And I have to tell you, we have to work on creating a space in our home and none of us are going to do it perfectly. We're going to probably um, 
make an incredible amount of mistakes, but we have to be intentional every day to lead those that God has put in our sphere of leadership. And you may think, well, my kids are already grown, or I don't have kids yet, or my kids are too young, or there may be a dozen excuses why you don't think that now is the time to create the space in your home in which you are creating an environment for God's will to be fulfilled in your life and in the life of those who are looking to you for leadership. It's not as if Joseph and Mary just went, whoa, like they leave church, they, you know, they had Simeon and Anna, they had had these angelic visits, they had had all of the craziness go on in their life, and they just didn't go, wow, that was crazy. Well, yeah, let's, I can't wait to, let's use this 90 mile journey to decompress, to get our minds together and help us figure out how to get back to our normal lives finally. Their obedience didn't stop when they left church that day. Their obedience began as a journey early, early in their story when they first heard God's will spoken into their hearts and their minds, and they continued to follow God's plan for their lives. And then when it got challenging, and then they had the prize, they had this fulfillment of God's promise, the prophecy, ancient scripture had been fulfilled. They've got Jesus. That's what God had been preparing them for this moment. And I have to tell you that God has things that he wants to bring to life in the world because of you. He has a vision, a purpose, a dream, a plan, something that he's birthing in you. And I'm going to tell you how to raise that thing. And I'm going to tell you that you have children in your home that God has put his promises into, his purposes and his plans into. There are people at work, there are neighbors, there are friends, there are co-workers, there are complete strangers that are watching you for leadership moments. And God is calling on you to create a space, an environment everywhere you go. I want to tell you that the momentum of Christmas doesn't have to stop on December 26th, on today the 27th, on tomorrow the 28th. As we continue to roll and all of a sudden we've hit the reset clock, we're in a new year, and we think, okay, I get to just put all that behind me. No, no, no. God has been trying to put things, conceive things inside of you that he wants to bring to fruition, wants to bring to life in the new year. And he's counting on you to do that. And I want you to use the momentum of a renewed awareness of the hope and the light, the kindness, the mercy, the generosity, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and God's holy word, which points us in the direction that we should be going. So we are going to start next week. We're going to regather in person if you feel okay with doing that, much smaller crowds. And we're going to create a safe environment to do that. If you're not ready, continue to attend here online. But we're going to start a new series together. We're going to begin to mark the new year for our success and following God's plan and God's will for our lives. And I'm excited for that. But That doesn't mean we put away everything from this year. It means we carry all that God has put into us to create an environment, to create a game plan for God's highest and best in the new year. Let me pray for you, and then we'll wrap up. Father, thank you for everyone that's gathered here. Our whole church is online this weekend. Some of us will go back to attending together next week. Others will stay here online, but we want to be in each other's lives so that we can hear the voice of God and speak the voice of God to each other, that we can encourage each other, so that we can be encouraged, so that we don't lose the momentum of what happens in this glorious time of year, this really magical, wonderful time of the year in which we're so aware of Jesus and his story, we don't want to lose the momentum of this time. And so I pray that the things we talked about today would help people move further into the Christmas story. The director's cut, the verses that come from uh, 21 through 40, and that we have a roadmap to living this year in victory, in your plan and your purpose for our life, in your highest and best for each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.
thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never Just 